Welcome to RTD Interviews. Today I'm excited to have first time guest, Mr. Lester Esteban, the CEO and director of Traction Uranium. Lester is an experienced mining executive with over 15 plus years in the mining, chemical, as well as industrial space. Today he joins us to share his thoughts on the economy, his expertise in the mineral area, as well as possible opportunities in the uranium sector. So, uh, Lester, welcome to RTD Interviews. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. You know, uh, yeah, I got a great program. I can't wait to uh, share a little about Traction Uranium, who we are, what we're doing up in Canada's northern Athabasca Basin with all of your uh, subscribers and viewers. And I'm just excited and pumped to be able to share our story with you. Definitely, definitely. So thank you once again for joining us and uh, definitely looking forward to dive into more of the energy sector. And so here on the channel, we cover a variety of commodities, primarily gold and silver. Uh, due to the economic issues we're facing, but I like to dip and dab in new sectors just to educate myself as well as the viewers. So looking forward to find out more about the energy space because it is crucial. And I know the air, the way the world is shifting now, uh, you know, clean energy is something that everyone is racing towards. And I think you guys might have a valuable solution for the world. So definitely look to find out more. But before we dive in, uh, as a CEO and director of a company, I'm curious to get your thoughts on the global macro space. What are some things you're keeping an eye on in reference to whether it be energy or any other space when it comes to mining, et cetera? So what do you keep an eye on these days? Well, what I'm looking at is in terms of like, uh, for example, right, like right now I'm in actually South Korea. And one thing uh, we've noticed is we are I'm constantly getting these heat wave warnings and it's getting up to 35 degrees, 40 degrees. And just a week before, uh, it was uh, extreme flooding, uh, not a lot of rain, uh, a monsoon season. So we're getting all these drastic weather changes that keep uh, occurring. So I don't know where, you know, if, wherever people sit on, you know, climate change and in terms of climate crisis, but the weather is definitely changing. Things are a lot different. Uh, so I'm keeping an eye on in terms of like all these little things that are you know, that are the fundamental changes in the nuclear uranium industry. Whereas, you know, if we're looking at looking at it from an angle of like climate change and, you know, trying to meet Paris Climate Accord, uh, trying to maintain one and a half degrees in, in terms of like uh, degrees before 2050, you know, these are some of the things that are a lot different in terms of what's affecting the nuclear and uranium industry. Um, also, of course, political, uh energy security is such a crucial piece to the thesis for uranium and nuclear power as what we're seeing in terms of like the conflict in russia and also recently what's what we see, what we saw in nigeria right good point good point good point so that's what i want to head into next because i follow a variety of geopolitical issues and they all seem to be interconnected in some capacity but uh, the recent coup in nigeria definitely impacts i think the energy space because you uh, nigeria is one of the it is the biggest uh, uranium producer on that continent there and of course it's a french uh influenced uh region and so there's a lot of issues there with them saying russia's involved whatever whatever but uh, as far as supply and demand i know that by this event taking place it definitely puts a little bit of a concern in the energy space so i'm assuming are you hearing anything from perhaps your colleagues or anybody in that in our you know sector in reference to what's happening there and how it might impact the, the uranium space well, you know, I am, I, my home is Saskatoon and Orano is based there. So Orano is the uh, French uh, company and producer. And, you know, Niger is about 5% of the world's uh, uranium. So it's a leading supplier to the EU. So I think they supply over 24% of uranium to the EU imports slightly above actually Kazakhstan. Um, so, you know, they're a very crucial supplier to, you know, Europe and uh to France as well. But in terms of like when you're looking at powering a nuclear power plant, the nice thing about nuclear power is, you know, typically when people have a, the fuel rods loaded into the reactors, that'll probably last you around two years. Whereas they will also have a secondary supply of uh, rods ready for that resupply. So you have about maybe a four to five year window to before you have to actually do a reorder point. So, you know, in, in terms of looking at um, what's happening in Nigeria and, uh, and also, you know, the, if there's any fear of a disruption in supply or demand, because of the way, you know, the timelines that, that nuclear, uh, like the, the order, the people that have to order the actual nuclear reactors and the rods and the uranium, they have actually a long horizon to uh, order their next fuel cycle order. So, you know, 
there is some issues going on there, Niger. There won't be too many problems uh, in terms of a, a disruption in supply, and that's just thanks to the relative order point or how long it takes, how long you get to before you have to order your next fuel cycle or fuel rods. Uh, understandable. Now, you know, regardless of what's happening in Nigeria, assuming you know, just from a supply and demand space, you know, there's this big revamp uh, in the global energy markets in general. And so is the world producing enough uh, to meet demand at this current pace that we're at now, or, or is there uh, the demand outstrip the supply that's currently available? <laughs> You know, that's a, you know, that's a great question, Mike. So let me just go some numbers. So uh, there's about 440 uh, reactors uh, in the world right now at this present point. So this will require about, I would say 74,000 tons of uranium oxide uh, concentrate, which is about 62, 63,000 tons of uranium uh, from mines. Okay, so that would be more the demand. In terms of supply, mines uh, in 2021 is the numbers that come to me in my head. Supplied about 56,900 or, or just under 57,000 tons of uranium oxide concentrate. So that's about 48,000 uh, tons of uranium from mines. So essentially that's 77% of the utilities annual requirements. Uh, and then the balance is actually made up of secondary sources. So secondary sources would be uh, from like excess uh, supply from utilities, uh, you know, when uh, Fukushima happened, you know, Japan wasn't actually um, uh, purchasing any new uh, uranium. Um, so when, when after that bear market ended and we went into this kind of a 10 year drought of uh, after Fukushima, you know, a lot of people were shutting off their reactors. Um, a lot of people were, you know, selling their stockpile of fuel rods. Uh, you know, back then there was a program called Megatons, Megatons to Megawatts, where U.S. and Russia was dismantling um, excess weapon grade uranium. And that put out 15,000 metric tons of low and richer uh, uranium uh, for USA for U.S. nuclear power plants. So you had this secondary supply that was making up for the deficit. However, you know, with 440 reactors, uh, I believe the combined capacity of that would be just under 400 uh, gigawatts, so about 390 gigawatts. But when you look at each gigawatt of increased new capacity, that will require another 150 tons of uranium per year. Uh, of extra mine production, you know, and that's just routinely every year when they have to replace the rods. Uh, you add out if it's a new reactor or a new build, you're going to need, you know, that first fuel uh, load and then also your secondary supply and storage so that you have the next one to load uh, when you deplete your next rod. So that's going to be about 300, 200, 450 uh, tons for a first load for a new power so when you look at that and you look at you know what what you know japan is turning up all their reactors again uh, the inflation reduction act uh, in the u.s is uh putting in you know buildings into the industry uh you're getting a lot of uh new builds coming out of china they're really starting to build their nuclear fleet out um you know uk France, all of these countries, Canada uh, recently announced uh, the Ontario power generation is going to put in four SMRs. So that's another 1,200 megawatts of uh, new power coming out of uh, nuclear. So as you keep adding SMRs, uh, as countries are opening up to either extend the life of their reactors, like that's going on in the U.S., or adding to their reactor fleet, plus China's build out, I would say supply is thin, definitely getting thin, you know, so we're depleting all of this secondary supply. Um, a lot of the utilities are now starting to look at contracting out uh, their, their requirements. They're looking more for long term chemical, which is kind of like the uh, the leader of the pack or the darling of the pack is, is about, I think they're up over 30, 35% from last year. So, you know, when you're looking at supply and demand, I would say definitely things are definitely changing and it's fragile. 
is a good way to put it. So uh, with 77% 77 of the utilities and requirements and balance made from secondary new projects coming on, uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to get very thin. Interesting, interesting. So very fragile, uh, very interesting way to describe it. So mm -hmm. let's talk about, I guess, the attraction of uranium. You know, it sounds like you guys are in a good position, I guess, help meet some of that uh, demand. And so if you don't mind, share with us a little bit about the company and uh, just the origins of the company and how you guys got started, and we'll dive in further to it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're a uranium exploration company up in uh, Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin in northern Canada. So, you know, the Saskatchewan Athabasca Basin is uh, was discovered back basically in the 1940s. So the area has been active production for over 60 years, 15 and a half percent. Uh, which is over fifteen percent of the uh, uh, world's annual rain comes from this area. But what makes it unique is the Athabasca Basin is home to ten of the fifteen highest grade uranium deposits in the world, and we're averaging about twenty times the international average purity. Uh, nice thing about Saskatchewan is uh, we were ranked number two in the world for mining investment in twenty eighteen by the Fraser Institute. So we're a nice, safe uh, jurisdiction. Uh, for mining that has been uh, experienced with uh, uranium for a very long time. So a lot of our workforce in terms of uh, our engineers, our geoscientists, our chemists have a lot of experience in terms of uh, working with uranium. Um, we're listed on the CSE as TRAC, on the OC, OTC as TRCTF, and Frankfurt as Z1K. We have three properties in Saskatchewan's Athabasca Basin. We have our Grease River project, up in by Flint Lawn. Um, and then we also have our Hardy Bay, which is a JV with uh, uh, F3 Corp is what they're called now. And also KLS, which is our Key Lake South property. And that is our with our neighbor Chemical. So we're right, right above five kilometers is the actual Key Lake mine and mill. So we, our KLS project is just right beside, you know, a producing mill. Interesting. So I was going through your website and I saw I did notice, you know, your, your your projects there. So I guess, you know, give us, I guess, some of the details as to where you guys are at in each one of those, according to what, you know, potential investors should uh, know in reference to uh, seeing where you guys are at and where you guys are heading. Yeah. So uh, at Grease River right now, we, we just finished a gravity survey. So we're definitely, uh, this is one of our greenfield projects brought to us by Boontan, who's on our technical committee. Uh, our Key Lake South project is definitely one that is uh, pivotal for us. Uh, in our recent uh, programs, we've been discovering a soil survey and a sampling program. And, you know, we, we released this back, we, we found some black soil. And our team uh, took this black soil, or radioactive soil, and they took it for analysis. Uh, and then they found out that it contained actually uh, 0.96 or 1% uranium. Uh, inside that soil. So that's right, kind of pretty much at surface. So then we did our winter program and our, our drilling program. And what we discovered is we, we hit a six meter zone of high radioactivity. So, you know, we're really excited to get back there to take a look at the basement or the overburden of that soil because, you know, it's just pretty much right at surface. Uh, at 1.7 meters in, we hit a six meter zone of that radioactivity. So we really want to know um, and get that sampled, analyzed, and to see if that's uh, uranium in there. As you know, our Key Lake South property is uh, is neighboring chemicals, Key Lake Mill. So the dynamics in terms of getting uh, product over and being so close to a mill is just it's it's just great. It's just it's it's a uh, great dynamics to have that. And then our Hardy Bay project, uh, we will be doing an ice rope program. We just did a press release, uh, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, where uh, you know, uh, with our partners, we, we you know we uh, found some new radioactive boulders, and you know we're just vectoring in on the source of these uh, historical uh, radioactive boulders that were found on Isle Brochet. So what we'll be doing is we'll be coming back to it this winter, or sorry, uh, winter 2024. For an ice road drill program there so we got some great stuff going we're, we're following up on a, a exciting kls program that we did in a spring summer drill program and then we're going to follow and we're we can't wait to get back to hardy bay in terms of being able to do that ice road program as we're vectoring in on the source of those uh, historical boulder trains 
Interesting, interesting. So uh, I was going through the website. I noticed you guys have a very, um, uh, uh, I guess, extensive team. Uh, your technical committee has a lot of, you know, PhD level individuals on there. And one of the individuals, Bhutan, stood out the most. So, so I guess, you know, give me some information as to like the team you guys put together there to help further advance, you know, the projects you guys got going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's a great question, Mike. You know, we have, aside from having uh, exciting properties, we've got to have a great team as well to back it up. Boontan has been, you know, in the basin, basin since the 1970s. So, you know, the, in terms of experience, uh, this guy has it. He's uh, pretty much the legend in the field. You know, he discovered uh, Key Lake, which led to, or, or he discovered a Gartner endowment deposit, which led to pretty much form the Key Lake deposit and which led to the development of chemicals Key Lake Mill. So, you know, uh, Dr. Bhutan has just been an amazing resource to our team in terms of bringing in that, you know, f over 50 years of experience in Athabasca Basin uh, exploration uh, to our team. Uh, coupled with that, just recently, we've also added Ken Wheatley, uh, another legend in the field who has been in, in been mining, you know, uh, been, sorry, in exploration in Athabasca Basin for over 50 years as well, since the 70s. You know, this guy has, I believe, made eight discoveries and four have gone into production. So, you know, we want to back up and ensure that our projects, our properties have the experience and the knowledge of like some people who are pretty much writing, who have written the, you know, who, who have written the book in terms of uh, uranium exploration in Canada's Athabasca Basin. So that expertise really adds to the thesis and you know, uh, what unlocking the potential of our projects, you know. Interesting, interesting. So as you draw towards the end, um, you share with us, well, share with us, you know, all the key key points that uh, I think the viewers are definitely interested in hearing about. So as far as uh, your ticket symbol, you care with that. Now, I guess, you know, from a uh, share price, uh, I think 85% or so is held within the company, within the company or whatnot. Share with us some details, <clears throat> excuse me, on that as well as your current market cap and things of that nature. Yeah, so, you know, we have, uh, I would say about 37, less than 40% is uh, from founders and strategic partners. Uh, another 54% uh, is uh, institutional high net worth. So, and Fission 3.0, which is our JV partner for, or sorry, not Fission 3.0, uh, F3 Corp is what they're called now. It's about 8% uh, of our shareholders. So, a very tight, nice, uh, good shareholders who are in it for the long term uh who believe in uh what we're doing out in the basin and you know who are out there to you know with us since the beginning and will be with us for a while so that's that that's the most important thing to us is to ensure that you know we have uh is, you know a good core base of shareholders as well uh, i believe our uh about 77 million shares are issued in outstanding and, you know, we have a $1.7 million in the door, another $1.5 million remaining for uh, flow through commitments. And, you know, yeah, so we're, we, we got a great shareholder base. And, you know, I believe uh, last time we looked at it, we were about, you right, about 30, 31 cents, 31 cents per share. All right. All right. Well, Lester, I uh, thank you for joining us and uh, sharing some details about Traction Uranium. Definitely. It's always good to learn about new opportunities out here and give the viewers something to uh, consider. And so if people want to find out more, of course, point them back to where they can, I guess, you know, learn more about the projects and things of that nature, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you can go to TractionUranium.com. Uh, please uh, follow our news alerts as you know, we're coming into uh, our, our next run, of, our, our next follow-up program, especially coming into Hardy Bay, Grease River, and, you know, our catalyst, Key Lake South, as we come back there for a winter drill program. All right. Once again, thank you for joining us on RT Interviews. Looking forward to having you back on, hopefully in the future, and find out where you guys are at at that point. And definitely hope you guys, wish you guys the best and continue to do what you do. And definitely uh, the world yeah, needs, so. you know, some new energy sources. So I hope you guys uh, wish you guys well. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, on Mike. Thank you so much.